and welcome back to Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite food writers. It's about all of life through the prism of food. And this week we're eating to save the planet with Philip Limbury, global CEO of Compassion and World Farming. Philip is one of the most important campaigners against factory farming. He and I have worked together on his podcast, Stop the Machine and the Big Table. And he's appeared on the Delicious Podcast and on Right to Food, the voice of the Food Foundation, in a bid to change the food system. I do think that there is a portfolio of solutions. Eating more plants, uh, eating less but better meat, milk and eggs, making sure, by better, uh, making sure it comes from pasture-fed, free-range, organic. So broadly speaking, regenerative food sources. I think that's really important. He's painted an apocalyptic vision of the impact of food production on the planet in his books Farmageddon and Dead Zone, Where the Wild Things Were. In his latest book, 60 Harvests Left, he picks up the soil where farmed animals once grazed, naturally fertilising the land and providing rich pickings for the bugs and worms, and showed us what our junk food culture has done to it. But it's not too late, he says. Not quite, if we change the way we think about the food we buy every day. I began by asking him to remind us of the connection between factory farms, wildlife, plants, soil and the way we eat. Well, the quick answer is they're all inherently connected uh, and in, in not a good way through factory farming, through the intensive farming of, of, of animals like pigs, chickens and hens that are kept in, uh, in cages, which looks like a space-saving idea but actually isn't because in confining them, taking them out of pastures and woodlands, we have to then use vast acreages, massive land uh, tracts to grow their food or their feed, as we call it, elsewhere. And the industrial production of animals is usually accompanied by the industrial production of crops using chemical pesticides and fertilizers and monocultures of cereals and soya and, and uh, uh, similar crops. And in that transaction, what happens is that intensive production drives out biodiversity. It means that the bees that are needed for the pollination of our, of our crops see their numbers plummet. It means that wild birds and other animals uh, disappear. It means that, that forests are wiped away uh, in, and that our soils go into decline. And with that comes the, the, the human component because as our soils decline, so does the future of our food system. So frankly, there is this concept now of one health, one welfare, that we as humans, our well-being relies on the health and well-being of animals and a thriving environment. Industrial farming, factory farming works against all of that, causing ill health and uh, a diminishing countryside, which is actually bringing an end of our food system as we know it. A hundred years ago, it would have been a very different landscape, wouldn't it? We would be looking out over farms and we would be seeing a living soil. And that's the point of your book, isn't it? Yes, we're talking about the interrelationship between factory farms and soil. But actually what's gone from that because of factory farms is the actual life. Zoom back a hundred years and juxtapose that with a picture of what life looks like now with factory farmed food. Soil is where 95% of our food comes from. Soil is also a major uh, carbon capture substance for us. Our soils worldwide uh, hold twice as much carbon as there is in the atmosphere. The other thing which soil does is it's the it's the one thing which stops much of the, the world's rainwater simply flushing into rivers and disappearing back into the sea. It holds water against gravity and allows it to, to nurture uh, thirsty crops, thirsty plants. So soil is absolutely fundamental to our food system. 
and we signed a contract with that soil 10,000 years ago at the dawn of agriculture when we as humanity, we as a species, we decided to move away from hunter-gathering uh, and move to a settler's lifestyle, an agricultural lifestyle where we were depending on that soil. We, co- we, we essentially signed this contract with the soil where we look after the soil and the soil looks after us. But one human lifetime ago, about 70 years ago, at the turn of the Second World War, things started to change. We started to tear up that contract with the soil by taking farmed animals off of the land. Previously, they'd been part of, the, of, of fertilizing the land through their, through, through their mixed rotational uh, movements and through, through droppings, through their cow pats and what have you. We took them off the land. We separated uh, farmed animals from the land and essentially started to treat soil like dirt. We started to treat it like um, a, 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 just a, a growing substance rather than uh, a living, breathing ecosystem. And that is why soil has been disappearing at such a rate that the UN has warned if we carry on like we are, then we have just 60 years left before our soils are gone. No soils, no food. Game over. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, the plan for intensive farming came from the intention to to produce much, much more food. And we needed it at that time. There were people starving uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and you go into the whole story and remind us of what farming was and, and what happened to it. Can you trace that history for us? What happened to, to, to really kind of change the relationship between farmland and farmers? Well, essentially what happened uh, uh, through my analysis is that uh, settlers on the, on the, on the uh, Midwest plains of America were encouraged to, to, uh, to make a living uh, in quite difficult circumstances. And uh, they, uh, they were so good at uh, producing crops that they actually produced bumper harvests. And those bumper harvests in, in the law of supply and demand meant that oversupply of the market led to market crashes. And this was part of what precipitated the Wall Street crash of 1929, causing desperately hard times financially for people in America and, and uh, beyond. And for those that were farming for a living, they were in such desperate times that their their crops were now re, were now giving half the money back. So if you can only get half the money for your crops, how do you make up that shortfall in income? Well, what they decided to do was the only thing that there was uh, open to them, which is to, uh, to to produce twice as much, making the problem even greater, which led to soils being uh, exposed to the open atmosphere and the winds on the Midwest Plains coming along and whipping up these gigantic dusters, soil dusters, black clouds as high as a mountain range and 200 miles wide that just rolled across the Midwest Plains, turning cities from day into night where people couldn't even see their own hands in front of them and where where one mother, for example, was was, uh, said to have, have contemplated killing her children rather than leaving them at the mercy of Armageddon desperate, desperate times. The US government stepped in with a subsidy package, a rescue package for, for farmers. Something called the, the which has now been, been come to be known as the US Farm Bill. Uh, and in that moment, the subsidy regime for farming was born, the modern subsidy regimes as we know it. Uh, and what happened was there was this unintended consequence that grain, the crops were now so ubiquitous and so cheap 
unintendedly that you may as well just feed them to animals. So animals were taken off the land, put in cages in confinement and fed these crops in this new, what became seen as the American way, the modern way of farming. This was rolled out into into Europe, into UK, and has subsequently been uh, pushed across the world in increasing amounts in subsequent decades, causing enormous animal suffering. It is the biggest cause of animal suffering on the planet. It's a major driver of wildlife declines. It is also integral to driving uh, the climate emergency that now that we, we, we can see. The, the world's burgeoning livestock as a result of this uh, of, of factory farming has meant that uh, we've gotten to the point where uh, globally the livestock sector produces more greenhouse gas emissions than the direct emissions of all the world's planes, trains and cars put together. It's an unintended consequence. It's not the fault of farmers. It's been brought about through circumstance and through 70 years of government policy and subsidy driving farming towards intensification. Yeah, and there is a definite correlation, isn't there, between the waste mentality. We treat animals as disposable. We no longer have the compassion to even care that they're kept in confinement. Most people will admit to buying their meat from supermarket without a clue where it lived its life. I mean, as global CEO of Compassion and World Farming, and that is your job to make better farming practice for the sake of the animals, how hard is it to persuade people to change their consumption and their buying practice? Well, I think that people, uh, persuading people that factory farming um, is cruel and shouldn't happen um, is the easy bit because I think people generally have great uh, empathy for animals and don't want to see animals suffering. The big hurdle, the big obstacle is the fact that factory farmed food generally isn't labelled. You don't go into a shop and see uh, pieces of meat labelled produced from animals kept in caged suffering for the whole of their life. What you see is a piece of meat that's labelled as fresh or farm fresh or or natural or or country fresh a whole range of terms to disguise the way that the that the animal lived and died so i think it comes back to government policy and subsidy that drove the rise of factory farming it is uh, the failure of policy leaders of government to properly ensure that food is labeled clearly that is holding back what i would see as a consumer revolution that would otherwise be taking place. Why am I confident in saying that? Well, because actually we got honest labelling for eggs in the UK and Europe uh, about 20 years ago. Now, battery eggs have to be labelled eggs from caged hens. What we have seen is that now most supermarkets and restaurant chains like McDonald's and and, uh, other big names, pizza chains and so on, won't use battery eggs. They're all using cage-free eggs. What we can see from this is if you put it on the label, consumers will turn away from cruelty and will make more compassionate choices. If they're in factory farms, if they're kept away from the land, the soil will suffer. That's the main point of the book, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the main point of the book is that we need to bring back farmed animals uh, and the right stocking densities. Obviously, we, we don't want to flood the countryside, um, but bringing farmed animals back to, to the countryside, taking them out of factory farms as part of mixed rotational farms in harmony with, with crops so that their, their droppings naturally re-fertilise the land. Uh, and so we don't need artificial fertilisers. We move away from chemical pesticides. And in this way, we revitalise the ecology of the landscape uh, and start to move to a better place, 
naturally we create a nature friendly future it brings back soil health it brings back biodiversity it helps to store more carbon from the atmosphere it helps to conserve more water for our crops what's not to like so moving away from factory farming is not only compassionate to animals it's also compassionate to people and to our children's future absolutely it makes the most sense and we're going to start going through your four food moments now take us back to the first ideas behind the book so Duke, our rescue dog, he's, uh, he's a 35 kilo Rotty Staffy Alsatian cross. And he and I are out walking the fields and the forests around our West Sussex home. We live on a farm hamlet. So we, we, we're able to see the good and bad of farming. We live in the, the folds of a rural landscape where things look different every single day. And as a naturalist, as an animal advocate, it makes my heart sing. But also there are things which, which we see that are not so, uh, not, not so good. But what that does is it helps me to be a better advocate for change. Yeah. And it was on one of these walks with Duke that you saw a tractor ploughing across a footpath. And you noticed that there was no birds behind it. And why were there no birds behind it? Because there was nothing for the birds to to pick at. And that was the moment, wasn't it, that made you think, I need to talk about soil. I've talked about the dead zone. I've talked about Farmageddon. Now I need to really focus on the soil. You know, when you and I travelled by Eurostar to Brussels when we were doing the Stop the Machine podcast, I was looking out the window and I said, where are the cows, Philip? (laughs) And I was sort of making an idle comment, thinking, where? There's no cows anywhere. And that's when you first told me about going to the Po Valley. It was one of the early stories that really moved me when we first met. Where are we now with the cows producing Parmesan? And what did the work that you did with Compassion on that actually achieve? Well, by raising the issue that cows belong in fields rather than spending a lifetime in barns, sometimes even tethered so they can't even walk around the barns, by by highlighting that, we have uh, started a dialogue with with the uh, producers, with the consortia behind Parmesan and uh, and uh, 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 Grana Padana cheeses. Uh, But progress is slow. We need to keep up the pressure. And I think the reason why that pressure needs to be ramped up is because by taking those animals out of the fields, by keeping them in barns, is not only, uh, I believe, misleading consumers um, who, who believe that the, the cows are, are living more uh, bucolic lives, but it's also um, uh, the, the, that farming practice generally of intensification is causing wider harms to the countryside. So things need to change. And yeah, you you remember right, Jilly, that I travelled through the Po Valley, which is the agricultural heartland of Italy, for three days uh, during the main part of the year when you would expect animals to be outside. I expected there to be loads of them. In those three days, I didn't see a single animal out of barns. Uh, It was a real wake-up call. Yeah, absolutely. You took yourself all over the world to write your various books and you talked to farmers and people who are really giving us hope for the future. But it was your Google Earth journey that you decided to choose for your second food moment. Well, what COVID did was meant that I had to spend pretty much two years that I'd earmarked, uh, uh, peppered with travel, if you like. I had to spend it at home. I couldn't uh, go to Idaho in the US. I was going to go to South Africa. I was going to go to Australia and see eye-poppingly large feedlots of cattle where 100,000, 150,000 cattle or more are standing in the same place with not a blade of grass in sight. But what I did was I learned how to use Google Earth. And I got the coordinates from the internet and I went to the exact feedlots that I was planning to go to, only from the comfort of my armchair, looking down on th- this huge site of uh, of 100,000 cattle in, uh, in in dusty pens in 
I went literally around the world in 80 minutes. Um, your third food moment is about an alternative to those cattle lots, because, of course, that is feeding the the junk food industry. Tell us about that first moment when you were trying what could be, and certainly was branded, as the, the answer to those cows' distress. Well, exactly. One of the things that uh, we, we has got a lot more prominence in, in recent years is the fact that as a global society, we're eating too much meat and dairy, and particularly in high-consuming countries like the UK, Europe and the USA, there is a growing need to cut down on animal products, to cut down not only for our own health and for the animal's sake, but also to get food and farming back within planetary boundaries, to stop it, uh, bringing the earth to, to its detriment, if you like. And I'd heard this, oh, we're going back now, 2017, and I'd heard about this new product, Beyond Meat, one of a new generation of, of plant-based uh, meat alternatives. Um, the others are, are impossible burgers. Uh, they were only available in the US, and I remember going to... to uh, uh, a, a colleague of mine's house. I had been, I'd been asked to speak at the uh, the Decatur Literary Festival, which is uh, on the outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia. It's the biggest literary festival, independent literary festival in the in the U.S. So it was a big thing. And afterwards, they hosted a little party for me, uh, to where I could try my first Beyond Meat burger and to see whether I liked it. Uh, and you know, I watched watched as they, they, they sizzled and popped on the, on the barbecue, just like meat, disconcertingly like meat. And they popped them in the bun and I took a bite. And they looked at me. Did I like them? Well, actually, I ate three and I didn't feel hungry for a week. I was that full. They were delicious, so delicious and so enthusiastic was I that when we hosted uh, a Compassion and World Farming Extinction Conference in the autumn, our patron Joanna Lumley uh, and, and I had the great pleasure of having the first UK public tasting of the Beyond Meat Burger. And again, that was my second taste and they were delicious. And I was there, absolutely. That conference was an extraordinary uh, telling of news stories. I remember one half of the conference, there were probably about a thousand people there, you know, experts from all over the world. And a, a show of hands in a, in a question from, from the panel, who thinks that going vegan overnight would save the planet? And half of the hands went up. When vegans say to me, Philip, and they always do, go vegan and save the planet, what, what would you tell me to tell them? I think without doubt, reducing um, meat and dairy and egg consumption uh, is good for the planet. We eat far too much uh, livestock products and uh, that has to change. Uh, I do think that there is a portfolio of solutions. Eating more plants, uh, eating less but better meat, milk and eggs, making sure, by better, uh, making sure um, it comes from pasture-fed, free-range, organic. So, broadly speaking, regenerative food sources. I think that's really important uh, because that way we can help turbo boost uh, the soil health, which is so important, as well as making sure that the animals are, are, are well kept. I think that's really important. There are other parts to this solution. Um, for, for those that perhaps don't want to go down the route of only eating plant-based foods, um, as as well as moving to 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 less and better meat and and, and milk, um, in the future, in the near future, I think that the the old, another alternative will be uh, meat from cell culture, and this will be real meat only produced without growing an animal. Instead, it will be produced in uh, in a uh, a bioreactor. Sixty um, harvests left is the title. I mean, a number of people who I've talked to about the book, they go, oh my God, that's absolutely terrifying. But you offer real stories of hope. The subtitle is How to Reach a Nature-Friendly Future. Tell us some of the people who you met who are really giving you a glimpse of a, a more hopeful future. 
Well, the book is framed around the four seasons. Uh, the, the the summer is uh, where we are now, which is uh, you know a society seemingly um, uh, living forever you know, in a consumptive party, if you like. And as we go into autumn, we can see the, the leaves turning uh, as we, we see the impending climate change and collapse of nature. Winter is about what life could be like if we, if we don't turn things around. But m- the majority of the book focuses on spring because I've met people and I've seen solutions that are, are simple, are life-affirming, are beautiful, are here and now, and can turn things around if we let them. I've met wonderful regenerative farmers like Gabe Brown and Will Harris in the US, where you know, the, their farms are an absolute uh, pleasure to see. Farmed animals, cattle. Are wandering rich pastures, followed by sheep, followed by pigs, and followed by chickens, in a harmonious uh, symphony of rotation. In this country, in, in the UK, I, I, I've met with regenerative farmers similarly who are making these things work. And then there are the rewilders that are genuinely bringing environments back, self-willed environments, habitats that can go the way that they want to and bring back wildlife. And what my book is doing is it's knitting these solutions together uh, into what I call the three R's of a sustainable future. The first is a regenerative agroecological approach to farming. In other words, farming in harmony with nature, where animal welfare is central. The second is rethinking proteins, where we, we, we're, we're not only um, seeing animal products as as proteins but we're diversifying more plant proteins more uh, uh, more f- uh, modern foods as i call them um, uh, technological based solutions that are coming down the track like uh, cell culture meat and fermentation based meat and the third is rewilding not least the soil and rewilding of the soil really means renaturing our farms and that brings us back to that regenerative generative restoration of the countryside through farmed animals coming out of these uh, horrific cages uh, and barns and instead feeling sunshine and fresh air uh, and a decent life. Yeah, and regenerative farming is becoming one of those those phrases that people are beginning to use. You know, not not food experts, not farmers, but you know, people who care about this stuff. It's one of those phrases that's really taking off. Uh, you know, eating organic was always an issue. There was always a, an argument about it. There is no argument about regenerative farming, is there? People who care about the soil, who people who care about what they put in their in their mouths, and people who care about animals really do find that this is a way that they can really get behind it could be a real movement very very easily oh absolutely i mean to me regenerative farming is all about bringing back the elephant not actually um big animals with long trunks and floppy years but the elephant's weight of biodiversity that should be uh, thriving in every football pitch sized patch of of healthy uh, arable land I really do believe that we should be bringing back the elephant to the UK countryside, to the European countryside, to America. And we can do this uh, by looking after the soil, by doing uh, the things which matter to to the soil ecology. So bringing farmed animals back as that part of that mixed rotational symphony, symphony that I talked about. Uh, and what that does is turbo boosts uh, the 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 uh, replenishment of their health of soil, particularly when it's folded with the use of cover crops to keep uh, fields from being bare. Because you know, one of the things which was very obvious during the Dust Bowl era in the US was was fields that are 
uh, open to to the elements, uh, are open to soil erosion. So keep the soil keep the soil covered up using cover crops. Use uh, complex rotation, and also the, the the other thing is to try to avoid deep ploughing of the soil to go to to what they call no till or low till. Uh, so w- what you really want to get to is a point where you're not only rebuilding soil uh, ecology, but that you're avoiding turning the world upside down for the creatures that you're intending to be there. Yeah, and let's just give that a little bit of a v- visual. You say up to four million worms can be found in a hectare of fertile land, potentially weighing more than the farmed animals above ground. That's what we want, isn't it? And and that's your fourth food moment. Ultimately, you are optimistic, aren't you? I'm very optimistic that the the solutions that we need to save the planet, uh, to actually to save ourselves, because that's what it's about. The planet will survive anyway, but saving ourselves relies on us transforming the food system. And by transformation, I mean moving wholesale away from industrial agriculture and its over-dependence on diets heavy in meat and dairy, and instead moving to that regenerative future where farmed animals are again restored to the countryside and where we rethink our protein so that we're eating more plant-based and and other proteins that uh, don't rely on animal farming, uh, and that we do in keep the animals in ways which helps to bring back soil health, which helps to capture carbon out of the atmosphere by storing it in the soil, which conserves water and brings biodiversity flooding back. To me, those solutions are so commonsensical and so right and in keeping with everything that we know uh, and feel, I think, as, uh, as, as a society, to be right. A nature-friendly future has got to be the way to go. Thanks for listening. You can read the transcripts at jillysmith.com, where you can also sign up to my newsletter. And you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at foodjillysmith, where you can keep up with my adventures in cookery with Leaths Online. Check the show notes and on Instagram for full details of how to get Cooking the Books discounts on Leith's cookery courses. And I'll see you next week. Bye.